Hello, Professor. We could start. Okay. Thank you. So You're thank welcome. you all for your interest. Uh, uh, let us start the first lecture. Uh, spherical varieties, which are the main subject of my lectures, uh, is a remarkable class of algebraic varieties uh, with a rich automorphism group. Uh, in particular, they are quasi-homogeneous. Uh, this means that they contain uh, an open orbit for some uh, nice algebraic group. Uh, spherical varieties and spherical homogeneous spaces have many different characterizations, uh, but I shall not give a precise definition now. It will come later. Uh, today's lecture will be somewhat introductory. I will start with a couple of uh, motivating uh, problems. So the first problem will be uh, will belong to representation theory. In representation theory, uh, one of uh, fundamental questions is uh, how to decompose a tensor product uh, of two irreducible representations into irreducible summits. So the problem of tensor product decomposition. Uh, let's consider this problem uh, for representations of the group SL2. Uh, this is two by two matrices uh, with determinant one over complex numbers. SL2 over complex numbers. So in this case, uh, the irreducible representations are well known, of course, namely for any non-negative integer n, Uh, there exists a unique uh, irreducible representation of dimension n plus 1. So actually of any given dimension. There is a unique irreducible representation of any given dimension. Uh, this number n is... Uh, uh, less uh, by one uh, than the dimension, uh, and it is called the highest weight of the representation. So uh, 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 this representation uh, is realized in the space of uh, polynomials, homogeneous polynomials of degree n in two variables. This space I will denote it by C of xy uh, with the subscript n. And for short, it will be denoted by V of n. So V of n is the space of irreducible, of um, homogeneous polynomials uh, of degree n in variables, in, in, the, in the variables x and y. And uh, the group SL2 acts on this space by linear substitution of variables. So uh, the decomposition of, of the tensor product of two irreducible representations of SL2 uh, is given by a well-known Klebsch-Gordon formula. Let me recall it for you. Uh, it reads as follows. Uh, the tensor product of V of N with V of M uh, is isomorphic as an SL2 module, as the representation of SL2, to the direct sum of the following irreducible representations. V of N plus M 
plus V of N plus M minus two plus V of N plus M minus four, etc. So each step, the highest weight decreases by two and this ends at V of N minus M where we suppose without loss of generality that m is that n is greater or equal than m so this formula is of course classical well known uh, and uh, there are many ways to prove this formula uh, for our purpose uh, uh, the most interesting uh, way to prove it is the geometric way So what is the geometric proof uh, of uh, the klebsch gordon formula? Uh, we argue as follows. Uh, the first observation is that this space V of N of homogeneous polynomials in X and Y um, of degree n uh, can be identified with the space of global sections h naught of a certain line bundle over the projective line. This line bundle is denoted uh, by O of n. So this is a certain line bundle, which I will describe right now. And this H naught stands for the space of holomorphic sections. Of this line bundle. Uh, so uh, uh, what are the fibers uh, of the line bundle O of, of N? So if you have, uh, if you take a point P on the projective line, uh, then the fiber over this point uh, can be described as follows. So what is a point on the projective line? Actually, it is nothing else but uh, a one-dimensional subspace in the two-dimensional subspace, in, in the two-dimensional space C2. Let me draw a picture for you. So we have a two-dimensional space and we have one-dimensional subspaces. So this is the origin. This is C2. And the projective line uh, uh, it can be uh, considered as uh, the line at infinity of this C2. Let me draw it somehow, the line at infinity. Uh, and each point, so this is P1, And each point on this projective line corresponds to a one-dimensional subspace, uh, to a one-dimensional subspace uh, in C2, uh, uh, which uh, which is a line. And actually, uh, we can we, we may say that uh, the intersection of this line with the line at infinity is exactly this point P. So this is the correspondence. And now the fiber of, uh, of the line bundle O of N uh, over the point P uh, is the set of all functions on this line, on this one dimensional subspace, which I again denote by P, C valued functions on the one dimensional subspace P, uh, which are homogeneous of degree N. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if you multiply the coordinate on this line uh, uh, by a scalar, then the value of the function is multiplied by uh, the nth power of the scalar. Uh, so um, 
each of these functions, uh, each, each 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 of these functions can be extended to the whole C two, uh, and then we get a homogeneous polynomial in the variables x and y, uh, uh, so that actually uh, this fiber can be uh, considered as the quotient space of the whole V of n, the space of homogeneous polynomials, modulo the annihilator of this line. If you like, you can view this space uh, in this way. Uh, well, um, I'm not quite sure that uh, all of you are familiar uh, with the language of line bundles uh, or vector bundles. Maybe you are, maybe not. But anyway, let me make a small digression on this subject. So digression. Uh, on line bundles and more generally vector bundles. So suppose uh, you are given a complex manifold X Uh, and another manifold, uh, say, E, equipped with a, a map onto X, a map uh, pi onto X, such that uh, the following two properties hold. First, the fiber over each point of X, let me denote this fiber as E sub P is a vector space over complex numbers. Uh, this is the first condition. And the second condition is uh, what is called local triviality. Uh, this means uh, that uh, there is an open cover of X X can be uh, decomposed as a, a union of open subsets U sub I uh, such that Uh, the uh, the restriction of uh, this uh, E over each open subset of this cover, the restriction means just the inverse image under pi. I'm sorry, sometimes you see these drops of ink. I don't know how to manage with it. Maybe my uh, pen tool is uh, too sensitive. But anyway, I hope it's not, not that important. So uh, the restriction of E uh, over each uh, of UIs uh, is isomorphic. Oh, with the direct product of UI uh, with some fixed vector space, say, of dimension R. Uh, and this isomorphism is fiberwise linear. Fiberwise linear. Which means uh, that uh, it is linear on the fibers uh, of, uh, of the, of the uh, respective maps. So the, the maps are on to U sub i. Here it is the projection map. Here it is the map pi. And uh, here it is uh, the projection map, the natural projection map onto the first factor 
of the direct product. Uh, so um, the isomorphism above uh, 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 this one is fiber-wise linear, and the whole diagram commutes. So when these two conditions are satisfied, we say that uh, that uh, E together with the map pi is a vector bundle of rank R over X. Okay, uh, this uh, manifold E is uh, sometimes called the total space of the vector bundle, and uh, pi is the projection map. Uh, what is a line bundle? A line bundle is just uh, a vector bundle of rank one. So the fibers are one dimensional. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what is a section? Uh, what is a section uh, of uh, a vector bundle or a line bundle, the case which we are interested in now? What is a section? A section is a map from the base, say, S from the base X to the total space I, uh, such that uh, the uh, value of S uh, at the point P, so S uh, takes values uh, in the fibers of the points. So S of P belongs to the fiber over P for any point P in X. Let me draw a picture, some uh, illustration, a picture for your convenience. So su suppose you have this uh, base manifold X, you have uh, the total space I over X, you have this projection map Pi, uh, you have the fibers, these fibers are vector spaces of fixed dimension. Uh, so if you have a point, say, P here, then this is the fiber E sub P, a vector space. And a section is a map whose graph I am drawing now. So this is the graph of my section. So the value at P, this S of P sits here. So this was uh, a digression about vector, vector bundles and line bundles. And in our example, in our example, Sorry. In our example, uh, we have a vector bundle, a line bundle over P1, uh, and we are interested in the space of global sections. So uh, P1 can be covered by two open charts, two open affine charts, which are affine lines. I will denote them as a1 sub 0 and A1 sub infinity. This means that I am removing
this grid. We have C2, we have a uh, coordinate. I'm sorry, let me try to do better. We have a uh, coordinate uh, axis on C2. Uh, we have the line at infinity, which is my projective line, P1. So this is uh, this is the uh, infinity point. This is the zero point of my projective line. And as you remember, uh, each point on the projective line, each point P, corresponds to a one-dimensional subspace in C2. There are many such subspaces. Okay, something like this. Uh, and uh, when you remove, uh, say, uh, the infinity point, uh, then you remove the x axis uh, uh, from the, from C two. And the remaining lines, all the remaining lines intersect uh, the line uh, which is parallel uh, to x x to the x axis uh, on level one. This one. So this is y uh, the the y coordinate uh, equal equal to one here equals to one here. Uh, and uh, uh, what is the trivialization of my line bundle over each of these charts? So uh, if you have a point P, say, on the second chart, A1 infinity, uh, uh, this means uh, that the second homogeneous coordinate, uh, the second projective coordinate is non-zero, and we can make it equal to one. So this point can be uh, uh, can be written as a tuple, a pair of homogeneous coordinates uh, z and one, where z is the ratio of sorry, this these drops are a bit annoying. Uh, z is the ratio of uh, x and y. Z is x over y. Uh, now uh, we can identify all fibers of my line bundle O of n over this affine chart uh, with one and the fixed vector space uh, of dimension one, that is uh, the restriction uh, of the line bundle O of n over this affine chart can be decomposed as a direct product. Of, uh, of this uh, affine line and uh, C of dimension one, the correspondence is as follows. So uh, uh, recall that uh, uh, the vectors in the fiber over P are just, um, just um, uh, functions, homogeneous functions of degree N over the line P. So if you have such a function, you can evaluate this function over the vector with coordinates z and one. So we get a complex number f infinity, which is f of z comma one. So uh, you take this, this vector, this one, uh, uh, and this uh, uh, this evaluation gives you uh, the trivialization uh, uh, of your line bundle because uh, you have chosen uh, an identification of each fiber with one and the fixed uh, vector space. Uh, exactly the same thing you can do uh, uh, over the second chart. So if you take the restriction of O of n over the a fine chart where the zero point is removed. Uh, again, we can identify it 
with the direct product. Uh, in a similar way, that is uh, a vector in the fiber, f goes uh, to the value of uh, this uh, homogeneous function of degree n at the vector with the first coordinate equal to 1. If pi is uh, the same point as above, uh, then uh, it, it can be written uh, uh, in homogeneous in projective coordinates where the first coordinate is equal to 1, and then the second coordinate should be equal to 1 over z. So maybe I should put these notations in the picture. So 1 is the uh, y coordinate, and excuse me. It's better to do it by a straight line. And Z is this one. OK? Uh, and uh, uh, if, uh, if the point uh, we are considering, uh, if the point we are considering uh, sits uh, in the intersection, of these two affine charts. Actually, most of the points uh, belong to the intersection, except for zero and infinity. Then we have two presentations uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the vector in the fiber, uh, na namely over the first chart and over the second chart. And these two presentations are related uh, in the following way. So F infinity is z to the n times f0. Uh, because when you pass from this vector to this one, to this one, when you pass from this vector to this one, you have to multiply the vector by z. And when you multiply the vector by z, the value of the function is multiplied by z to the n, because it is homogeneous of degree n. So this is the description uh, of uh, the line bundle, which we consider in, uh, local, um, in, I, 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 in local trivializations. And now it is uh, clear that um, if you take a section, say S, Uh, over my line bundle, uh, of my line bundle over the projective line, then uh, uh, over the second uh, affine chart, uh, A1 infinity, uh, it can be considered uh, as a holomorphic function in, in the variable C, in the variable Z, holomorphic function. Uh, uh, because uh, the fiber at each point is identified with just with, com with the field of complex numbers. And uh, uh, when you vary the point, uh, you get a function, a holomorphic function in Z. Uh, and... Um, I'm sorry, Professor. You... Yes, uh, yes, you may ask a question. Yes. Uh, so uh, what is the point corresponding to like the like an f so it is just the intersection point z1 uh what is the point corresponding to to what oh, please I'm please please that. repeat your question uh i i didn't get it maybe what is the point corresponding to uh, so um okay um can we see the um a fine space uh, in the picture yeah. So 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 let me maybe uh, repeat quickly. Uh, so pi is a point on the projective line with coordinates. Uh, excuse me. It seems that I have somehow erased it. Okay. So pi is the point uh, on the projective line with coordinates with projective coordinates x and y. Uh, and it can be written in many ways. So the projective coordinates are not uniquely defined. They are defined up to a multiple. Uh, 
uh, if the second coordinate is non-zero, uh, then we, we can make it equal to one. We just divide by y, and we get the second coordinate equal to one, and the first co coordinate will be equal to x over y, so to this z, okay? So we can, we can write the point in this form, the coordinates of the point in this form. But uh, if the first coordinate is non-zero, then we, we can do vice versa. We can make it equal to one. So if x is equal to one, to one then y becomes equal uh, to uh, y over x over this uh, previous x, uh, which is z inverse. So uh, the same point can be written uh, in the second chart uh, uh, with the coordinates of this form, one and uh, one over z. Is it uh, the question which you asked? And can can we see the trivial um, light bundle in the picture? Uh, well, more or less. Uh, so the fibers of this line bundle are these lines, okay? These lines, these one-dimensional subspaces. But uh, when you remove uh, the horizontal line, the x-axis, then all these fibers can be canonically identified with C. So uh, the identification, uh, well, maybe uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm cheating a little bit. This is a picture uh, for another uh, line bundle, for the tautological bundle, uh, 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 which uh, is O of minus one in this notation. Uh, uh, the fibers of the tautological bundle are these lines. And the fibers of uh, the bundle O of N are functions on these lines. So uh, this line is somewhat dual to the one described on the picture. I cannot, uh, I cannot draw it on this picture. I just uh, described uh, how it trivializes algebraically. So I identified uh, each fiber with complex numbers by, by this or on the other chart by this identification. So it is not on the picture, but somehow it comes from the picture. Uh, I don't know if I, <laughs> if, if I answered well. Is it okay? Professor, I want to yeah. ask a question. Okay. Is ON the disk bundle over S2 with Euler number N? Uh, yes, 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 exactly, exactly. This is, the, the, the notation is standard. The notation is standard from algebraic geometry. So this is uh, the same O of N, which uh, you are used to, if, if you are. I just explained this construction for those who, for those of you who maybe uh, uh, didn't hear before about this kind of things. So if you know this, then there is nothing uh, new for you uh, so far, okay? Well, let me continue. Uh, let, let me continue uh, this description. So uh, on the other chart, the same section uh, can be described uh, uh, as a holomorphic function in the variable uh, one over z. But the relation uh, between these two trivializations is given by the formula right above. So they are related by, by this equality. So both S infinity and S zero are holomorphic functions. The first one is in Z and the second one is in one over Z, in Z inverse. Uh, and since they are holomorphic functions, they are expanded in power series. But uh, how can it happen that a power series in Z is obtained from a power series in one over Z in Z inverse by multiplication with uh, Z to the N? This can happen only in the case so this implies that actually S infinity is not a power series. It is just a polynomial and of restricted degree, of degree at most n. Only in this case, such kind of equality, such kind of equality may hold. Uh, and if you uh, uh, if you uh, pass from f from the affine coordinate z to projective coordinates x and y, uh, this means uh, that you have to multiply uh, 
both coordinates uh, by y, then uh, the uh, value of the section s at uh, this tuple and this pair of homogeneous coordinates will be equal to y to the n times s of z times uh, s infinity of z. And uh, by this, we get a homogeneous polynomial of degree, a homogeneous polynomial uh, of degree uh, n in the variables x and y. So it belongs to uh, the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree x and y. This is how to derive the, the uh, space of global sections of this line bundle O of n is exactly the space of homogeneous polynomials. So let me let me maybe again draw it on the picture. So if you take any other vector on this line P, say with coordinates x and y, then uh, the value of f of s at this vector, so uh, recall that uh, uh, s is a fiber-wise homogeneous of degree n function uh, on, on these lines, in particular on the line p. Uh, then we get this polynomial. So this is how to derive the description of uh, the description of uh, the global sections of uh, this line bundle uh, as uh, the space of polynomials, the space of irreducible representation of highest weight n in our uh, in our terminology. And now let me come back uh, to the proof of the Klebsch Gordon formula. So let's consider uh, let's consider the uh, uh, product of two projective lines, P1 cross P1. Uh, oh, this double projective line, uh, this, actually, this is a quadric, uh, if you know, from algebraic geometry. We have a, 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 another line bundle denoted as O of n comma n, which is an outer tensor product of the two line bundles O of n on the first projective line and O of m on the second projective line. What is the outer tensor product? This means that uh, the fiber of this new line bundle over each point in P1 cross P1, which is a pair of points on P1, P and P prime. So the fiber is just the tensor product of the fibers of the fiber of the first line bundle over pi over p, and the fiber of the second line bundle over p prime. This is how the outer tensor product of uh, two uh, line bundles or even two vector bundles on two different manifolds uh, is defined. Um, the space of Global sections of this line bundle over P1 cross P1 is the tensor product, is the tensor product of the spaces of uh, sections over these uh, two uh, tensor factors. So O N and the second one o m it is not uh, quite trivial but it, it is not not that difficult uh, some standard fact from algebraic geometry or complex analytic geometry but i won't uh, discuss the proof now uh, and uh, in our previous notation, it can be described as the tensor product uh, of V of N and V of M. Uh, now let's uh, note that the group SL2 acts in a natural way 
simultaneously on each factor. So it acts on the product of P1 and P1, P1 cross P1. Uh, and this action is not transitive. Uh, there are two orbits, actually. So this, this uh, product, P1 cross P1, can be decomposed in two orbits. Two orbits. Uh, the first one is, uh, oh, is an open orbit. It is the set of uh, pairs of distinct points on P1. It is an open orbit in this product. Uh, and the second orbit is uh, the set of pairs of coinciding points that is just P1 embedded diagonally into P1 cross P1. So there is a big orbit, open and dense, and a small orbit which is closed. Let's keep this how, in mind. Yes? How do Any we question? How do we operate the actions? Uh, how do I define the action? Well, uh, the action of SL2 of E on each P1 uh, is just the natural action uh, by Möbius transformations, by linear, uh, linear substitute of projective coordinates. And when you act on a product of two uh, P1s, then you act uh, simultaneously. So let me write down that uh, maybe not here. Maybe here there is some place. So if you act by an element G on a pair P, P prime, you get just g of pa, g of p, g of p prime. And the action on each projective line, as I said, is the natural one. On this line and on this line, which is the same, this is the natural action by, uh, uh, by uh, linear uh, Substitute of uh, yes, I see projective yes. coordinates. Okay, okay. So, um, well, uh, now let us restrict. Uh, maybe, maybe again. I like to draw pictures, but with this uh, handwriting tool, it is not so easy. It is better on the blackboard. But let me try. So this is the picture. These are my copies of P1, and this is the diagonal. That's enough. So, um, well, uh, now let me restrict, let me restrict the line bundle O of N comma M uh, to the diagonal. Uh, then we get just a usual tensor product of line bundles over P1. We get O of N tensor O of M, which is nothing but O of N plus M. Uh, when you multiply a function which is homogeneous of degree N with a function which is homogeneous of degree M in, uh, on a fiber, on each fiber, you get a function uh, which is homogeneous of degree N plus M. This is clear. Uh, now uh, let's consider the restriction map on global sections. So we get, uh, we get a restriction map from here Uh, to the global sections of the restricted bundle over P1. O of N plus M, which is in our notation V of N plus M. The restriction onto the diagonal. What is the kernel of this map? Well, 
Well, uh, if you have a, a section uh, of uh, this bundle O of n comma m, Mr. Bracket here, uh, it is a polynomial uh, in the coordinates both uh, on both projective lines. So uh, it is a polynomial in x, y, x prime, and y prime, which is homogeneous of degree n in x and y and of degree m in x prime and one pri and y prime and if it vanishes when restricted to the diagonal if it vanishes uh, when x equals to x prime and y equals to y prime uh, uh, this holds if and only if uh, uh, the polynomial f is divisible uh, on the equation of the line the equation of the diagonal uh, of the diagonal line is uh, the determinant uh, is given by the determinant of this uh, matrix x y x prime y prime. If this determinant equals to zero, then the points p and uh, p prime coincide. So this is uh, actually a basic fact from algebraic geometry that uh, if you have a hypersurface uh, and uh, some function which vanishes on this hypersurface, then uh, it is divisible uh, by the equation of this hypersurface. But uh, let me leave uh, an elementary proof of this fact for you. It can be proved without algebraic geometry in an elementary way. So let, let this be the first exercise for you. to prove it, uh, to give an elementary proof. Of this fact. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, this means, uh, coming back to the question, what is the kernel of this map? This means that the kernel is as follows. It is this determinant, this determinant, multiplied, so maybe let me put cross here, multiplied with uh, some polynomial, uh, with a space of polynomials of degree n minus one in xy and n minus one and m minus one in x prime and y prime. This is the section uh, of uh, the line bundle over p1 cross p1, which is O of n minus one comma m minus one. Uh, and uh, also let me remark that this uh, restriction map is surjective because it is obviously non-zero. And uh, the section, uh, the space of section uh, of uh, this uh, line bundle below is an irreducible uh, SL2 module. Uh, if you have a non zero map uh, onto an irreducible module, uh, uh, it is surjective by, by Schur's lemma, for instance. So, uh, what we finally get. we get the following uh, formula. Uh, v of n, tensor V of n, is isomorphic to the direct sum of V of n plus m. And, excuse me, and V of n minus one, tensor V of M minus one. Uh, this, uh, excuse me, uh, this uh, tensor product is just uh, uh, the kernel of the restriction map. And uh, this summon is the image of the restriction map. But since it is an irreducible module, it can be lifted. Uh, uh, in, it can be lifted to to, to this tensor product uh, to the space above. So we have a direct sum decomposition, 
And now from this direct sum uh, decomposition, we can uh, derive the clebsch gordon formula just by induction. Because we can do the same thing with this uh, tensor product. Uh, again, this is a, a space of sections of some line bundle over P1 cross P1. We can restrict it to the diagonal and so on. So this is a geometric way to prove uh, the klebsch gordon formula. And I shall stop the first half uh, of my lecture uh, now. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, then do not hesitate to address these questions to me. Any questions so far? Professor, uh, what is the notation of three points? I, I'm not very clear. The exercise. Uh, which, which notation? Exercise something, one. something here. And the three points, uh, vertical three points. Vertical? It means the uh, multitude of the, the determinant. The uh, what what is the notation for this? Uh, or, excuse me. Uh, what is the notation uh, for 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 this? No no no. Uh, below exercise one. I mean, for this three, three points in the middle. I mean, divisible. Three, po ah, three points. I see. I see. I understand. I said divisible. Divisible. Uh, let me. Uh, uh, let me. Uh, this is a shortcut for divisible. F uh, divisible by this uh, by this uh, polynomial. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, may I ask the, a basic quest, uh, a basic um, formula for the tensor product of O n tensor O n equals ten uh, O m plus m. This one. Uh, no. The, this the one. one below. Below. Uh, 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 this yeah, one, yes. yes. Okay. How should I think about it? Uh, well, how to prove it? Uh, 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 how how to explain it? Well, there is nothing to prove actually. Well, um, uh, 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 let's uh, let's recall somewhere above, I guess here, that uh, the fiber of uh, each one of these uh, line bundles, the fiber of O. Of, uh, of this line bundle O of n over uh, pi uh, is by definition the set of functions on the line pi. Pi is a one-dimensional subspace in C2. It can be identified with the one-dimensional subspace in C2. So the fiber is the set of all functions on this line uh, which are homogeneous of degree n. Okay? Yes. And now coming back to this uh, to this uh, to this formula, if you have a function uh, which is, uh, or if you have a function on the line p, which is homogeneous of degree n, and you have another function which is homogeneous of degree n, when you multiply these two functions, you get a function which is homogeneous of degree n plus m. Okay, do you agree? So it's. It's the tensor product here. It is exactly the tensor product because uh, uh, these spaces are, are one dimensional. They are the spaces of functions, homogeneous functions of given degree on, on a line, on a line, on one and the same line. If you take, if you consider the fiber, uh, the fibers over a fixed point. So these are uh, fibers over uh, one and the same point. Uh, the functions, uh, the sets of functions uh, of uh, uh, on one and the same line of given degree. And when you tensor these two spaces of functions, this is the same as multiplying functions. Well, I, I mean, uh, just, uh, it, it, it is an easy exercise in linear algebra. Just think about it a little bit. Uh, it's not that easy. But uh, uh, if you agree with this, uh, then uh, uh, you see immediately that when you multiply one function with another one, then the degrees uh, sum up, and you get a function of degree n plus n. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Any more questions? Well, Vn is the space of the section or the representation space. Uh, 
why this space of section, uh, this section sections so is a represent. How we use the end? We use it only as a space of section or the space of the representation. Because well, uh, well, uh, well, uh, I uh, identified uh, the space of representation with the space of sections uh, on some uh, of the previous boards uh, somewhere. Here. I know that. I know that. I'm not asking this. But what what is your question then? I, I didn't get your question. Sorry. Uh, I'm asking. Why is the holomorphic section on P1 times P1? Yeah. Yes. Why is this also a representation space? Well, because because uh, because uh, everything uh, oh, is yeah yeah yeah. I, P1 times P1. I mean uh, I mean maybe 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 I uh, I, I uh, skipped this. I didn't explain this in detail. But but everything uh, is equipped. Everything here in the picture is equipped with a natural action of SL2, I would say, like this. So SL2 acts on everything. It acts on the base space. It acts on P1. It acts on P1 cross P1. It acts on the total space of each line bundle, which appears here. So this is basically the explanation. And that's why it acts also on the, set, on the space of sections. OK? Would you please say again um, how to define the annihilator of a point P and how's, how's the linear, um, how's the trivialization on each chart works? Well, uh, well, uh, as for annihilator, this is just, I mean, uh, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a global function uh, of degree n, this is a polynomial of degree n, homogeneous polynomial of degree n in, in the variables x and y, uh, then you consider the line, uh, the line uh, P, a one-dimensional subspace P in C2, uh, and you just consider uh, the space of all these polynomials which vanish on this line. This is a hyperplane in the space of polynomials uh, of degree n, and uh, this is the annihilator. And when you restrict to this line, when you consider uh, the functions only on this line, then you uh, mod out, you take a quotient by this annihilator. The restriction of functions means taking a quotient mod modulo uh, the space of vanishing functions. OK? Uh, this maybe was your first question. As for the second one about uh, the trivializations, well, uh, there are many things written here. Maybe you specify your question. <laughs> what, what, what is... Uh, precisely what you want to ask here. By the way, uh, let me say that um, uh, these notes uh, will be uh, saved in a PDF, and I hope that uh, Huhan will put uh, the PDF file somewhere uh, to make it accessible to all of you. So uh, if you missed some formula, uh, some previous formula on, on some previous uh, sheet, then uh, uh, you may come back to this formula uh, looking at these notes. But anyway, uh, if you have, still you have a question on this, on this slide, you can ask. Uh, just, just... Uh, pro professor? Yeah? Uh, could you explain the, how we get the kernel again in the fifth page, maybe, I think? Uh, the kernel the, of the restriction map. This one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you have uh, you have a space uh, you have the space of sections uh, of uh, of the bundle or, or on this product. Uh, you restrict each section to the diagonal. Then you you get a section uh, of the restricted bundle on, on a diagonal, right? Uh, and uh, this is how uh, this map is defined. Uh, and now, uh, if you want to understand the kernel of this map, then you are looking for, for sections uh, of the line bundle on the product, P1 cross P1, which vanish on the diagonal. Uh, the sections uh, uh, on the cross product are just polynomials in uh, four variables. X, Y are coordinates of, the point, uh, of a point on the first P1. And X prime, Y prime are the coordinates of the point, projective coordinates of the point on the second P1. And uh, the diagonal is given by the equation x equal to x prime, y equal to y prime. 
So you are looking for polynomials which uh, vanish on the diagonal. And uh, uh, if a polynomial vanishes uh, on the diagonal, it should be divisible by the equation of the diagonal. The equation of the diagonal is given by uh, vanishing of this determinant, of this determinant. The point with coordinates x and y is equal to the point with coordinates x prime and y prime if uh, these two column vectors are proportional, because the projective coordinates are defined only up to a scalar multiple. So uh, the equation for the diagonal in the projective coordinates is given by vanishing of this determinant. And so if you want your polynomial f to vanish on the diagonal, it should be divisible by this determinant. OK? So, so this determinant lies in O11, so we get uh, uh, th we This get determinant, that. exactly, exactly. You are right. This determinant is a section of O11. And if you divide a section of O n m by the section by a section of O one one, you get a section of O n minus one and m minus one. Exactly. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Okay, okay, great. So I think that uh, we have to uh, we have to continue uh, to uh, to go to the second half of my first lecture. Uh, here I think the bracket is again missing. Uh, we, shall we continue? Yes, the course is on. Okay, okay. Let's go ahead. Let's uh, go to the uh, second, let's turn to the second part of uh, my lectures. So now I'm going to discuss uh, the second uh, problem, the second motivating problem, uh, which I plan to discuss today. Uh, uh, the second problem is in enumerative geometry of conics. Enumerative geometry of conics. Uh, so uh, a conic is a smooth curve of degree two in the complex projective plane. Let me denote it by C. Uh, and it is given by a quadratic equation in projective coordinates uh, in the following way. It is the set of points uh, in the projective plane. So a point is given by a, a triple of projective coordinates, say x1, x2, and x3 in this is a point in P2, the set of all points in P2 such that uh, a given quadratic form, Q of x1, x2, x3, which can be written, it is a quadratic form, it, is, it can be written as a sum of Q, I, J, x, i, x, j, where i and j vary from 1 to 3. So this should vanish. This is a quadratic equation which gives you my conic and the smoothness condition. I consider smooth conics. The smoothness condition means uh, that uh, uh, this quadratic form is non-degenerate. The matrix uh, of Qij is non-degenerate. Uh, now, uh, a classical question posed by Jakob Steiner in, uh, in, 18, uh, in 1848, question, is uh, how many conics uh, are tangent to five given conics in general position? How many conics are tangent 
to five given conics, say C1, C5, which are in sufficiently general position with respect to each other. I don't want to explain precisely what does in general position mean, but maybe we shall see it later. Uh, maybe uh, let me again draw a picture for you. If I if I manage to draw a picture, so it is not so easy to to draw pictures with this with this tool, but let me try. So, not that good. This is the one conic. This is say, another one. Yet another one. I want them to intersect. Another one. So these are these conics, uh, C1, etc., C5, so CK. And I'm looking for a conic which is tangent to all of them. Let me try to draw it. It doesn't look like a conic, but anyway. I want it to be tangent to all of them. Okay, something like this. I look for such a conic C, which is tangent to each of these five conics in general position. Okay, so you may ask why five? Why not say three or seven? Uh, there is a geometric reason for that, uh, uh, and we shall see it soon. Now, uh, how to handle this question? Uh, let's first uh, reformulate the tangency condition algebraically. Uh, we may uh, identify uh, the quadratic form which defines uh, the conic with its matrix. So, uh, let me write. So I uh, denoted the quadratic form by Q, but this quadratic form can be identified with the matrix of Qij, of the coefficients. Do you require the matrix to be symmetric? Of course, because it is a matrix of a quadratic form. This is what I just wanted to say. This is a symmetric matrix. It belongs to the space of symmetric three by three matrices, which I denote like this. This is the space of symmetric three by three matrices. And also let's denote uh, uh, by X, the column vector of the projective coordinates of a point uh, on my projective plane. The column vector X of projective coordinates. It's, it belongs to C to the three. Uh, of course, you understand that the quadratic form uh, can be written uh, in a matrix uh, in matrix terms by the following expression. So you may write that Q of x1, x2, x3 is x transpose times the matrix of Q times x column. So on the left, Q denotes the quadratic form, and on the right, Q denotes its matrix, but we identify one with another, one with the other. Okay, so uh, what is the tangency condition? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, remark, let's observe that uh, the equation of the tangent line, so let me draw the tangent line, This is the tangent line to the conic C or to, to the conic CK, since they have to be tangent. Uh, the tangent line is the same at point P. So this tangent line can be uh, given by an equation, by the following equation. Y, sorry. Uh, y transpose times q times x equal to zero. 
uh, so this uh, column vector y is uh, uh, the vector of projective coordinates of a point on this line. Y1, y, y2, y3 are the projective coordinates of the points of the points uh, on the tangent line. So this is the equation uh, of the tangent line at any given point uh, of uh, C, of the conic C. And now we may say that uh, my conic C is tangent to another conic CK at the common point P if and only if the two conditions hold. So first, both, uh, uh, both conics should pass through this point. So X, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't get quite used to this, uh, to this handwriting tool. That's why these drops of ink uh, occur more and more. I try to avoid them. So uh, these two equalities should hold. So here I just wrote that uh, the point P belongs to both conics, C and CK. Uh, and the second uh, condition is that the tangent lines uh, at this point of both conics uh, should coincide. So this means that Q times X should be proportional with some coefficient lambda uh, to QK times X. So lambda is some coefficient. Uh, why so? First line, uh, I think you get wrong at the first line. Uh, the wrong? Trend, the trend uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, thank you, thank you. I'll correct this. Let me write it more accurately. Of course, thank you. I hope now it's okay. Uh, so uh, uh, let me explain the second condition. So this product uh, Q times X is the column vector. And this column vector is a vector, is the vector of coefficients of this linear form in Y1, Y2, Y3, in the coordinates uh, of, of the point uh, Y. Uh, so this is uh, the column vector consisting uh, of the coefficients uh, of the equation of the tangent line. Uh, but if, uh, uh, the, the, if the two lines coincide, this means that the coefficients are proportional of one. Uh, the equations are proportional, not exactly equal, but proportional. So this is why this uh, proportionality coefficient lambda comes in the picture. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the tangency condition at a given point. Now let's look at the second condition. Uh, the second condition means that uh, this column vector X is an eigenvector is an eigenvector uh, for uh, the following matrix QK inverse times Q. Uh, and lambda is its eigenvalue. And um, uh, the more so, it is not just an eigenvector. It is an eigenvector which is isotropic. Isotropic. Uh, with respect to the inner product on C3, uh, given by uh, the quadratic form QK. Because because of this uh, of the second condition of this second equality, so isotropic means just that the uh, the the inner square uh, of this vector, the value of the quadratic form is zero, 
if it is isotropic uh, with respect to QK, and if it is uh, I, if, if it is an eigenvector with respect to this A, then it is automatically isotropic with respect to Q uh, because uh, because of these two equalities. It is clear. So um, uh, when does such a vector X exist? Such an isotropic eigenvector exists. So uh, such an X, excuse me, uh, such an X exists. If, if and only if, uh, the matrix A has multiple eigenvalues, has a multiple eigenvalue. Multiple eigenvalue. Uh, an exercise for you is to prove this. What is A? Uh, just a moment. Uh, A is this matrix, QK inverse times Q. So Q and QK are uh, the matrices of quadratic forms associated with these two conics, C and CK. So prove it. Uh, as a hint uh, for the proof, uh, just use uh, that A is uh, a matrix, is the matrix of a symmetric operator with respect to the inner product given by this second quadratic form QK. And uh, the eigenvectors uh, of, uh, of a symmetric operator are uh, of different eigenvalues, are orthogonal to each other. Just uh, use this fact to prove uh, that, uh, to prove this statement. This is a hint for, for, for the proof. And uh, now, uh, when A has multiple eigenvalues, this holds if and only if the characteristic polynomial of A, that is the determinant, the determinant of uh, A minus lambda E, E is the identity matrix, uh, has multiple root has a multiple root. OK. Uh, now, if we again, uh, so let me again recall that this matrix A is uh, the uh, ratio of two matrices, QK inverse times Q. And if you multiply everything by QK inverse, uh, for instance, uh, if you mul multiply this matrix, uh, not by QK inverse, but by QK, uh, if you multiply the matrix in brackets uh, with QK, uh, you get the following condition. Uh, so finally, we get that uh, the conic C is tangent to CK at some point, if and only if the following polynomial determinant of Q minus lambda QK. If and only if this polynomial has multiple root, has a multiple root, which means that the discriminant of this polynomial, the discriminant of this polynomial should vanish. This is the algebraic interpretation, the algebraic equation given giving the tangency condition of two conics in terms of their matrices. So you write a polynomial, uh, you cook up a polynomial uh, of degree three uh, uh, from their matrices, and you compute the discriminant of, of this polynomial, which is some polynomial in coefficients uh, in matrix entries. Uh, and so the condition it, uh, the, is uh, that uh, uh, this discriminant should vanish. Let's look at this equation. So uh, we fix a conic CK uh, which means that we fix the matrix QK and we vary the conic C. 
so uh, this discriminant is a polynomial in matrix entries of Q. And it is not hard to see that uh, this polynomial is homogeneous of degree six. in the matrix entries of Q. Again, an exercise for you is to prove it. It is easy, actually. If you think about it a little bit, you understand why it is so. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let's consider the set of all conics as a geometric object. Namely, we consider the space of conics. Uh, let me denote it uh, as O. Uh, it is naturally, the set of all conics is naturally embedded in the projectivization of the space of symmetric three by three matrices. Because as we explained before, each conic is given by its quadratic form, by its quadratic equation. Uh, the quadratic equation, uh, the quadratic form is given by a three by three uh, matrix, symmetric three by three matrix. And uh, two quadratic equations uh, give one and the same conic if and only if they are proportional. They differ by a multiple. This means, uh, uh, this explains one, why we take the projectivization here. The projectivized space of uh, symmetric three by three matrices. The space of symmetric matrices uh, uh, three by three is of dimension six. And so its projectivization is a five dimensional projective space. And the space of conics is an open subset in this uh, five-dimensional projective space. It is given by the inequality that the determinant of the symmetric matrix uh, should be non-zero. It is an open subset. And also, uh, let me observe that there is a natural action of the group GL3, non-degenerate three by three matrix matrices on this space. Again, it acts on the space of uh, quadratic forms in three variab variables by linear substitution of variables. And this action induces the action on the projectivization, induces the action uh, on the space of conics. And of course, uh, all non-degenerate, all smooth conics uh, form an open orbit for this action. So the action on smooth conics is transitive. There is, it is a single orbit. So we have an open orbit in the projective space and uh, we have something on the boundary. The same picture as uh, in the first, uh, uh, in the, in the first uh, problem which we discussed uh, on the first half of my lecture. Okay, so uh, we interpreted uh, the space of conics uh, geometrically. And now let's observe that uh, this, the set of conics tangent to a given one is a hypersurface in this uh, space of conics, given by a single equation. Let me write it down. So uh, this one. So the set of all conics, all smooth conics, tangent to a given one. Tangent to C sub k. This is a hypersurface in O given by this equation, this one. It is a homogeneous equation of degree six in the matrix entries QIJ, which are the homogeneous, the projective coordinates on this P5. And when we close up this hypersurface, when we close up this hypersurface uh, in the projective space, Let me denote the closure as dk. 
we obtain a hypersurface of degree six in P5. Okay, so each, let me repeat again, each tangency condition uh, gives you a hypersurface in P5, okay? The set of conics uh, tangent to a given one belong to a hypersurface in uh, P5. And now let, let's recall uh, the classical Bizou theorem from projective geometry. Let me turn to the next page. Uh, if you are given n hypersurfaces, d1, etc., dn, in pn, in the projective space of dimension n, uh, so if these are hypersurfaces, in general position, Uh, in general position here means the following. Uh, each uh, uh, each uh, finite collection of uh, these hypersurfaces intersects transversally. Transversally means in the same way as uh, hyperplanes, as coordinate hyperplanes. So uh, if you have uh, n hypersurfaces in general position in an n-dimensional projective space uh, of degrees say d small one, etc., d small n, then the number of intersection points of all these hypersurfaces is finite, and it is equal to the product of their degrees. This is the classical theorem from projective algebraic geometry. By the way, now it is clear why we take five given conics in Steiner's problem. Because uh, each tangency condition uh, defines uh, a hypersurface in P5. And if we want uh, these hypersurfaces have a finite intersection, then uh, we should take five of them finite but non-zero intersection, then we should uh, take five of them. If, if we take less than five, then uh, the intersection will have positive dimension. So there will be infinitely many conics tangent to three or four given conics. If we take more than five, then the intersection will be empty because uh, some five uh, hypersurfaces intersect in finitely many points and the sixth one, the sixth one, if it is in general position with respect to the previous five, it doesn't pass uh, through each of these points. And the intersection of all hypersurfaces will be empty. So uh, this is the reason for the number five, the explanation for the number five. Now, uh, from the Bezu theorem, we get uh, an expected answer to Steiner's problem. Uh, since each of the hypersurfaces we intersect has uh, degree six, degree six, uh, we should get six. Sorry, I, I would like to choose another color. Uh, six to the five intersection points. This equals. 7,776. And this is the answer which was obtained by Steiner himself. But it turns out that the answer is wrong. Guess why? 
Any guess why it is not the correct answer? Is there not in general position? Exactly, exactly. So the reason is, the reason is that uh, the hypersurfaces which we consider in Steiner's problem are not in general position. Uh, why so? Because each of these uh, hypersurfaces contains uh, the set of double lines. The double lines are uh, degenerate conics. So let's again switch to the previous board. So uh, when we compactify the space of smooth conics, this O, uh, by this uh, projective space, we given by degenerate quadratic forms. And the most degenerate quadratic forms are given by the matrices of rank one. So this matrix Qij, uh, uh, should have rank one. Uh, this is the equation uh, for a double line on a projective plane. And uh, uh, when you have uh, a matrix of rank one, excuse me, better. If you have a matrix of rank one, then uh, this equation. Uh, this vanishing of discriminant is trivial because uh, the matrix uh, A is also of rank one and it has a multiple uh, eigenvalue, namely zero. The eigenvalue zero has a multiplicity uh, at least two. So uh, all these uh, double lines belong to each of the hypersurfaces DK. Uh, the space, the set of all double lines. So what is a double line? A line uh, uh, on a projective plane is a point in the dual projective plane. So the set of uh, all double lines uh, is a, a submanifold, which is uh, isomorphic to the dual projective plane. It is a two-dimensional submanifold. And all these hypersurfaces contain this two-dimensional submanifold, so they do not intersect transversally. Uh, they are not in the general position. Uh, what is a remedy uh, to this problem? We have a problem how to compute, uh, how to resolve uh, the, the question of Steiner, how to give uh, to obtain a correct answer. So uh, uh, what is a remedy? Uh, how to deal with this, with this uh, difficulty? A remedy is to consider another compatification of the space of uh, smooth conics. What is it? So uh, to each conic C, we may associate the dual conic C check. What is the dual conic? So uh, if you have a conic on a projective plane, you may consider the set of all tangent lines, all tangent lines. Uh, for this conic. Each uh, line, each uh, of these tangent lines is a point in the dual projective plane. So we get some set of points in the dual projective plane. So this sits in P2 and this sits in P2 star. And it turns out that actually, so let me write down that C check 
is the set of lines tangent to C. It is a subset, as I said, it is a subset in the dual projective plane. And it turns out uh, that uh, it is again a conic. The equation of this conic is given uh, by a quadratic by the quadratic form, which corresponds to the adjoint matrix of Q. So Q check. Let me denote this matrix Q check. It is the adjoint matrix. The matrix consisting of all cofactors of Q. Uh, here we need not to transpose this matrix because Q is already symmetric. Uh, an exercise for you is to prove this fact. So let me also let me also uh, uh, remark that uh, the joint matrix satisfies the equation that Q times Q check is uh, the determinant of Q times the identity matrix. This is the defining equation. Well, this is the uh, mo most uh, important property of the joint matrix. And an exercise for you, yet another exercise for you. Not difficult, in fact. Exercise four. is to prove it. Prove that C check is a conic uh, given by the adjoint matrix of Q. OK, so now uh, we can embed the space of smooth conics in the product of two projective spaces. The first one is this previous P5, uh, and the second one is a dual projective space, P5 star. The embedding is given by sending a conic C to the pair C and C dual, C check. So C is a conic uh, uh, on the plane P2, on the projective plane P2, uh, which is uh, identified with its matrix, uh, with the projectivization of its matrix. And the matrix uh, is in a six dimensional space of symmetric matrices three by three. Its projectivization is P5. And the dual conic is uh, in uh, the dual projective plane. Uh, and it is again given by a matrix, but it is natural to think uh, of the space of uh, uh, the matrices defining uh, this dual co this uh, defining conics in P2 star as the dual space to the space of symmetric uh, matrices we considered before. So the projectivization is a dual projective space. Well, this is not actually, uh, for the moment, it is not very essential. You may just take another copy of P5 if you like. But uh, essentially, it is the dual space. So uh, let's uh, consider this embedding. And let's take the closure of the space of smooth conics with respect to this embedding. It is a closure in uh, in uh, P5 cross P5 star. Uh, this uh, this uh, algebraic variety can be described as the following set. It is the set of pairs in P5 cross P5 star consisting of uh, pairs of points uh, Q and Q, say, star in in braces so q and q star are symmetric matrices three by three and uh, 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 brackets uh, square brackets uh, mean that i take the projectivization a point in the projective space 
So the defining equation is the following. Uh, Q times Q star should be a scalar matrix. So I do, I do not say uh, which scalar we take here. It may be any scalar. But uh, it is easy to uh, write this condition down uh, as an equation in matrix entries of Q and Q star, some homogeneous equation. So some, some matrix entries should be 0, and some other matrix entries should coincide for this, uh, for this product matrix. matrix. So this is uh, a projective algebraic variety, if you like. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this variety is called uh, the space of complete conics. Space of complete conics. It is uh, obvious that it, it is compact. because it is a closure of something in a compact manifold, P5 cross P5 star. And it is less obvious, but true, that it is smooth. Uh, let me again give you, uh, as an exercise, uh, to prove that it is indeed smooth. Exercise, I guess, five. Proof smoothness. It is not so easy as, as the previous exercise. It is some calculation. Uh, well, maybe you will be lucky to, to do this calculation. At least if you are uh, skilled in algebraic geometry, I hope that you, you will easily uh, resolve, solve this exercise. And uh, what is, uh, what is uh, even more nice, uh, if we redefine, if we redefine uh, the hypersurfaces dk, to be the closures of the hypersurfaces in the space uh, of smooth conics given by this tangency condition, but now you will you take the closure not in P five, but in P five cross P five, or equally in X. If we redefine these hypersurfaces in X, then uh, we have the following fact. The hypersurfaces D1, etc., DK are now in general position in X. Uh, I will not uh, prove it now, uh, and I dare not to give it as an exercise <laughs> to you, because it is even more complicated than the previous one. But we'll deduce this fact later from general theory, which we uh, hope to develop uh, in this course. Now, uh, if we uh, believe in this fact, if we take it uh, without proof, uh, then to compute the intersection number, we may use the cohomology theory. The cohomology theory uh, of the space of complete conics. Of course, we have to understand something about the cohomology of the space. And again, I will skip this. 
uh, at least uh, for this lecture, for this today's lecture. But uh, later on, uh, we'll develop uh, uh, we'll, we'll develop uh, the tools to to, uh, to 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 use for this computation. But anyway, uh, if we use the cohomology theory uh, of the space of complete conics, then we get the correct answer to Steiner's problem. Uh, now. Uh, the intersection number which we are looking for uh, can be computed uh, as the degree uh, of the product of the cohomology classes of these hypersurfaces Not k, I'm sorry. k should be equal to 5 here. Uh, the intersection number which we are looking for uh, uh, is equal to the degree of uh, the product of the cohomology classes of these hypersurfaces in the cohomology ring of the space of complete conics. Uh, and if you compute this, you get the answer, this remarkable, num this remarkable number, 3,264. There are exactly 3,264 conics tangent to five given conics in general position. This answer was obtained by Michel Schall in 864. So we'll deduce this answer from general theory of spherical varieties, which we'll develop uh, in the course later. Uh, and now, uh, finally, uh, uh, so I have to finish my lecture. Let me finish my lecture uh, with the following conclusion. The solutions of these uh, two problems which we discussed today leads, uh, lead us uh, to the following conclusion. Let me write it down. It is important to study equivariant compactifications or more generally equivariant open embeddings of good homogeneous spaces. In both problems which we discussed today, we had some uh, homogeneous uh, manifold, uh, some homogeneous space, either uh, P1 cross P1 uh, without diagonal or the space of uh, smooth conics, which we compactified in a certain way. And the geometry of this compactification uh, led us to a solution of some problem. So uh, what means equivariant here? Uh, if you don't know this word, equivalence mean, equivalent means equipped with the group action, which extends the group action on a homogeneous space, which we compactify. And what is good, uh, this will be explained later in my course. Okay, so I think I shall stop now. Thank you for your attention. And if you, if you have uh, any questions, then please ask. I have a question about the yes, of SL2, the 
in the first half. In the first half. Okay. Okay. Let me turn so to does, this. Does the same apply to PSL too? Well, yes, but uh, um, the problem is that uh, the action of PSL2 on the projective line doesn't lift, uh, doesn't lift to the line bundle. Uh, uh, what is acting uh, on the total space of the line bundle is SL2, not PSL2. Sometimes, uh, well, sometimes only in the trivial case. Uh, no, 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 I mean, uh, not, not only in the trivial case. So sometimes uh, the action of PSL2 lifts uh, to O of N, if N is even. But if N is odd, you cannot leave the action of PSL2 to the total space of the line bundle. That is oh. why I was considering SL2. I see, I see. OK. Any other questions? I have one question about the latter example. Uh, uh, what is the relationship of X and P5? Uh, here, right? No, 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 sorry, not here. Here. Well, X, uh, X is, uh, is a blow up. X is a blow up of P5. S is uh, exactly, S is, X is exactly the blow up of the set of double lines in P5. Okay. An ordinary blow up? Yeah, yeah, just ordinary blow up. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other question? Blow up at the rank one matrices. Yes, yes, blow up of the sub variety of rank one uh, matrices. Well, not uh, rank one matrices, but the projectivization of this set. You consider everything in the projective space, not in the space of matrices, but in the projective space in the projectivization of the space of matrices. Yes, yes. Yes, we need to, uh, the uh, the canals of Clark uh, Maybe you should uh, better ask in English because uh, because uh, uh, some other people could be interested in your question. Could you repeat it in English? What, как правильно говорить? So, so, so the five can also be the smooth, also smooth. Uh, which, which, the, which, the which, five, which, five, five conics. Uh, yeah, yeah, the conics, uh, the conics which we consider, the conics which we consider in Steiner's problem. So these conics, uh, maybe even the previous slide. Uh, these conics C1, C5 uh, are also smooth. So in, in Steiner's question, in Steiner's question, all conics are smooth. But when you want to uh, find the number of tangent conics, you have to compactify. You have to admit not only smooth conics, but uh, also singular conics. Or even more, uh, this uh, more peculiar thing as double conics. So you compactify not in the usual way, but in a peculiar way by this, uh, by this X. Well, как Кларк Фостер играет свои роли? Well, uh, well, so your question, uh, maybe your question uh, is whether, whether this number is preserved if if you degenerate uh, the conic, uh, uh, one of these conics maybe, to... Maybe where, where you used this uh, smoothness condition. Well, actually, it was my initial assumption. Uh, I, 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 um, uh, how to say? Uh, 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 I think that uh, I think that um, all this discussion, uh, all this discussion, is relevant uh, for smooth conics because uh, at a singular point you have many tangent lines and so on. So uh, there are some difficulties if if you if you admit singular conics in the formulation of Steiner's problem. Of course, if you formulate it in a proper way, maybe you you you, you may degenerate uh, conics CK to to singular ones. But uh, the classical formulation is is uh, for smooth. I mean, well, for instance, uh, what is a tangent line at a singular point? You you cannot define it uh, uh, uniquely. Yeah. So if you if you take a Zariski tangent space, then it is just the whole plane. Uh, it is uh, not clear 
how to yes. formulate the tangency condition. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions? Uh, professor, I guess that uh, uh, the X uh, parameterize all the uh, conics, including the degenerate ones, right? The, even the... more, even oh. more. X projects on 2P5. Uh, and in this sense, it parameterizes uh, the general conics as well. But over the generate conics, uh, we have uh, a fiber. Uh, so the projection, uh, the projection uh, of X to P5 is not one to one. So uh, if you take a double line in P5, then over this double line, you have uh, a positive dimensional manifold in X, a positive dimensional submanifold in X. So it parameterizes, but not uh, in a one to one way. It is only birational. The projection from X to P5 is birational, but not. Oh, so uh, X uh, does not actually uh, parameterize something. You may say, well, it parameterizes these peculiar things uh, called complete conics. Complete conics are pairs of conics in P2 and in P2 star, which are related by uh, some condition. Uh, and uh, this, uh, 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 for, for smooth conics, this is a one-to-one -one, uh, relation. So to each conic C, there corresponds a unique conic C check. But if C is not uh, smooth, if C is singular, then there are uh, many C checks uh, corresponding to C. So uh, what is parameterized by X is, a is this pair, which is called a complete conic a pair of conics in uh, P2 and P2 star, okay? Will the exceptional fiber formed by blow up all maps to the same point, right? Just like yeah. this? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay, so uh, are there any more questions? Maybe if you have uh, questions, if, if you will have further questions which you uh, which come up to your mind later, you may address uh, uh, these questions to me uh, on my email. Let me write down my email. So let's use this email for feedback. Uh, between the lectures, I would say. You are welcome to write and uh, address any questions to me on this email. Well, uh, and also, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning of the lecture, um, uh, I will uh, save these notes uh, in PDF, and I hope this PDF, I hope that uh, uh, Huhan uh, will make uh, these uh, PDF files available for all of you. No problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. By the well, way, so... and there's a WeChat group uh, for this course. If you want to join it, you can uh, download such an app. Uh, uh, which group? Excuse me. We WeChat group in the chat. Uh... Ah, WeChat. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh... I'm I'm not sure that uh, I have an account in, in this video, <laughs> but okay, you can send me the credentials uh, for for logging. I, I shall I shall see. <laughs> yeah, if you want to join it, you can download it. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, if there's no further questions, shall we end now? Well, if 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 not, if there are no more questions, we can end now. Okay. So thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for your questions. And I hope to see you uh, on next lectures. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor. Yeah. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.